Bless you. Good morning, church. Are we doing well? Excellent. We are continuing into our series on Luke. Now, I don't know how many times I'm going to have to say we're continuing in this series of Luke. Like, we've literally just got started. We're still in chapter one of Luke, and, and so you'd have to forgive me you know, to, to catch some people up on like what's just happened. But what we've seen so far is we've seen how Luke is a faithful man, that he has, he has written this document, this piece of literary art, and, and it is that. All the commentators would agree on the fact that this document that we call Luke is, is a Greek masterpiece and his grasp of the language and his grasp, his understanding of what happened so he could faithfully record it for this man Theophilus. And we can be sure and certain of the validity of it because of who he is and what he's recorded is verifiable by many other eyewitnesses to the events that happened. Now obviously we're not going to speak to any of the eyewitnesses that, that were there at the time, you know, apart from Jesus himself. But, you know, it's, it's a certainty that the things that are recorded in the book of Luke happened. And he starts off with the story of John the Baptizer and the fact that Elizabeth and Zechariah get this call to be parents, this, this marvellous mystery of this lady who couldn't have children has a miracle in her life and that God is able to change impossible situations. Amen. Amen. And we find ourselves here today and so I'm going to ask Sue to come and read the scripture for us this morning and I think this is a, it's a wonderful story with so much in it but let's hear it first. Yes. <coughs> In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's, Mary, uh, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Hallelujah. For no word from God will Let ever fail. Yeah. Come on. I am a Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So good. I, I want to start my message today saying that we have a problem in our country. We've got many problems in our country, in fact, but, but the problem I want to highlight is one of trust. There's a real lack of trust in our nation. I mean, I might ask someone like Ian, for example. Sorry, it's a pick on you, Ian. But do you have your phone with you? Yeah, would you let me, like, have your phone for a minute, please. Yeah, Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, don't don't throw it. That, that could have been dangerous. Sensual. Yeah, yeah. How about um, how about your wallet? Have you got your wallet on you? No, 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 no wallet. Well, we know we we know we know where that is. But this is the thing. People are willing to maybe trust 
with these things. Yeah, you can have your phone back. I'm not going to start going through your messages. But then there might come an instance, like I might ask you if you'd be willing to do a trust fall, for instance. Now, it's all right. I'm not going to ask you to do it, but we are going to roll a video. So if we can play this video, please, Christine, that'd be awesome. So cast your eyes heavenwards to the, to the screen. <laughs> love that, love that. So, is anybody up for a trust? trust <laughs> but you can see, can't you, right? It's, that was just a, a funny thing to happen. But we do have issues with trust. I mean, that man was very trusting. He was maybe too trusting. He hadn't had the full information. But there are so many instances in our nation where there have been polls being done. If we could have the first graph up, please, Christine. Now, I re- realise that this graph that was going to be put on the screen is probably too small for us to be able to read fully. But the a department of ONS, the Office of National Statistics, put out this, this um, survey to find out how well institutions are trusted in our nation. Now, we can see that at the top here, the green is where people trust, the, the light blue is where they don't trust, and the dark blue is where they're kind of neutral on the subject. They don't really know where they stand. I don't know if we can trust them people. But we have the civil service at the top as being, within government, uh, the most trustworthy of the lot. Uh, I'm not going to get political on this, just don't worry, it's just, just a, an illustration. We've got local government next, the UK government, parliament, and at the very bottom, the political parties. We have a very low degree of trust for each of the individual political parties. Um, but the civil service, in and of itself, we, you know, we, we kind of trust them. Can we have the next slide up, please, Christine? And so this next slide breaks down a little bit of trust within the civil services. So we've got the NHS is highly trusted. Most people trust the NHS. We've got the courts and the legal system, most people will trust that. And we go down through the education system, the police, social care services, international organisations and the news media. (laughs) Now I find that so interesting, I could talk about that for a long time. We don't trust the news media. So why do we consume it so often? Eh? Why do we spend so much time watching the news and scrolling on our social media feeds to find out information about our world? Curious, isn't it? Anyway, anyway, we'll move on from that. But there are so many instances where we don't trust what's going on around us. And there's other graphs, I I could have gone into a lot more detail with it, there's other graphs that demonstrate that young people actually have lower levels and degrees of trust for organisations that exist in the world today. Um, I think that's a problem for our country, I think that's a problem for our world. You know, I mean, God appoints leaders, doesn't he? He appoints people in power. Um, and so we have to be able to trust what God's doing in and through life in general, in society, even if we don't agree with it always. And there are so many instances where we don't agree with it. But this is where we are as a nation, isn't it? And already, I can, I can sense that maybe, even through what I'm just saying to you, you're like, oh, do I trust this guy? Do I... Do I trust what he's saying even? No, I can feel it. You've got that little lawyer in your mind, haven't you? Like, oh yes, this is, this is, I wonder where this is going. And then this other side, oh no, just, just shut off. Think about dinner. Dinner, dinner's good. Dinner's good. Think about it later on. But there are so many instances in the Bible of where this word faith and faithfulness, which is so often used interchangeably with the word trust, comes into play. I I did a quick uh, word search, um, not like one of those things that you get in a booklet, but I searched for a word and uh, I found there were 202 times where the NIV translation 
uses the word faithful 202 times where it's translated faithful or faithfully. Other versions, it's slightly less. I think the ESV version was 178, the NASB is 128. And so it's still used a lot, is the point. The way they translate this word faithful is used often. It's curious, isn't it? When you look into the Bible and you find the instances where these words are used, it's often used for characters like Abraham. Abraham was faithful. Moses was faithful. David was faithful. All of these men of God were faithful people. And now we get into the scripture for today, talking about Mary's story. <coughs> Mary, she's such an extraordinary woman. Um, and this is where the story of Jesus, like how we know it today, kind of gets going, isn't it? Luke has structured this book of Luke in a certain way and he's waited a little bit before he actually gets into Jesus. I mean, if you read the Gospel of Mark, it's Jesus like from the off, like you're straight into the action narrative, like you're there. But Luke is like, you know what, I'm going to provide a bit of background into the, this man, like where he came from, how it came to be. Like I said, we can trust the verified sources that he used. And so he's given us this background, a bit of context for us. And then we get into this story of Mary and this is the nativity that we know and and it's, it's fantastic. It's such a fantastic story because there's so much in this passage alone. Like last time out, we talked about Zechariah and that passage of scripture. We could have, we could have spent several sermons just exploring the depths and the riches of what that story can hold for us as people. And it's the same here with this initial, like being introduced to Mary and he's being introduced to Jesus from the off left turn but we went to Windsor Castle uh, yesterday my wife and I we went and had a, a lovely time down at Windsor Castle and it's really beautiful like, I don't know, how many of you have actually been to Windsor Castle and, and visited the place yeah I mean it's a beautiful place right isn't it I mean you go there and you just you, you have this awe and this wonder of this of this building this structure that's been in existence that's been inhabited for 1,000 continuous years. You know, it's been added to, and it's been built upon, and it's got all these wonderful like, artefacts in it from around the world, like from nobility giving gifts to other nobility. And you know, like, these are like the best of the best kind of pieces of art. Like we walked around one of the chambers and we're like, we recognise that painting, or we recognise that painting. Oh, that's a famous painting over there. And it's so regal. Like, everything about it. I came away and I said, I said maybe the most profound thing that I'm ever likely to say all weekend. And I said to my wife, I said, I think that's, that's one of the best stately homes I've ever been to. <laughs> well, it belongs to, like, the highest in the land, doesn't it? So you'd expect it to be, wouldn't you? But it, it was. It's so regal. Everything about it is, like, elevated to a whole nother level. And then we come back to this, this story of a king who came from heaven to be born in a, well, just in a, in a backwater, in a nowhere place. Like, imagine a Windsor Castle being in Sawbridgeworth. Like, could you imagine? Could you imagine, like, the situation, the context of this, that this lady Mary, who's going to be the mother of the king of the world, not just the king of a nation, yeah, the king of the world. And she's living in this tiny little town of Nazareth. And there's nothing regal about it. There's nothing magnificent. There's no wonderful paintings on her walls. There's no gold overlaid pieces of furniture, like in any of her rooms. She's just a young girl living her best life, looking forward to getting married. You know, she's betrothed to be married to this man, Joseph, and that's something to look forward to in a young woman's life, especially in this time, in this place. And God enters into her situation 
and uses this, this no one girl and it brings about the change that changed everything. The birth of Jesus that changed the way we all do life that changed the way the world, in fact, does life. And it's so good that we serve this Heavenly Father and it's so good that you're here because I think that someone needs to hear that God can use you wherever you are in your life. However you're feeling about yourself however you experience your current reality, your set of circumstances, whether you are someone that walks around in confidence or whether you are someone who's feeling a bit humiliated maybe, disgraced, maybe you're feeling a little bit not good enough, a bit less than, but God can enter into your situation And God can use you right now if you just let him. And Mary, she's phenomenal for several different reasons. She she trusts God completely. Like Zechariah, could we have that scripture up please from before. Luke 1 verse 18. We read in, in, Ze- in Zechariah's story that there's a wait. Okay, so we read in Zechariah's story that he asked the angel how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now if you wasn't here last time the context is Zechariah's living his best life. He's in the temple he's doing all the incense and stuff you know, like this once in a lifetime opportunity. He's like, yes, God, I'm here, I made it, I'm, like, I'm finally in the place, here's some incense for you, hope you like the smell. And an angel appears and says, Zechariah, you're going to have a son. I know you think you can't have a son, you've been trying for years, but, you know, the miracle is about to happen, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah turns around to this angel, like an angel appears in your life. I mean, are you going to question an angel? Like, seriously, like, come on. But he says to this angel, how can I be sure of this? He was a faithful man. He was blameless before God. We already explored this part of his story. He was a good guy. You know, they've been doing, he'd been doing his best to serve God all his life. Yeah? And then this instance happens and we compare and contrast Zechariah's response with Mary's because Mary gets this angel come to her and he says that you'll conceive and give birth to a son and you'll have to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son on the Most High and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary doesn't go, what, who, me? Like, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm just a, a teenage girl. No, no. She says, how will this be? Because I'm a virgin. Now, the compare and the contrast is Zechariah is questioning the authority. How can I be sure of this? I'm not sure about what you're telling me. Yeah? I'm not sure that, that even though you're an angel, right, you're an angel, I get that, you know, you just terrified me, and you're telling me this like word from God, yeah, okay, I'll get that. But how can I still be sure of this? And he hasn't learned from all those Old Testament stories of like Gideon who puts God to the test with the fleece and Moses who questions God. And he hasn't learned from, from these experiences, from these stories. And the angel goes, look mate, I get it, you're a faithful guy but you're not going to be able to talk anymore. Things are going to change for you. You're a faithful man. I get it, I understand. Nothing terrible is going to happen to you. You just can't talk until the baby's born. And he's like, all right, we can't say anything to that, can he? Because he can't talk. <laughs> but then you compare that with Mary, right? And Mary is, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. Yeah. How is this going to happen? I'm a virgin. I want to know the process, but I don't doubt it's going to happen. And he says that the Holy Spirit is going to come on you. 
You see, Mary trusts God and asks about the process. Zechariah's question was about assurance. And Thomas Aquinas, the old Catholic um, philosopher, he's got this great quote. If we can get it up, please, Christine, that'd be awesome. So the quote of Thomas Aquinas, he says this. He says, To one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Right? I, I think that's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I, I love that. That's, that's so, so good. To one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. You see, because trust, trust in and of itself, faith, is no respecter of your education level. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you are an educated priest like Zechariah was. Yeah, he was a faithful educated, priestly man. He was a man of God. He went around his life like trying to do things properly. He was blameless, the Bible tells us. Yet he still has to question God's word to his life. He's been faithful, yeah? He's been living the word of God out in his life. You see, Mary has faith. The difference is, is that to go from faithful to faith requires a change in direction. It requires a change in direction. See, this morning, right, we were singing, singing our worship songs. We were being faithful to the process, to the way that we do things in the church. It's not ungodly. It's very godly, in fact. But then, when a new song gets introduced into the mix, that's not, that's not on the, the, the hymn sheet, as it were, well, that is a step of faith, isn't it? That's not just being faithful. That's a step of faith. That is, well, here's a new song. I'll believe that God can speak to someone in this moment. I'll believe that God's presence is going to fall on someone right now because he's spoken a word into my heart. Let's introduce something new. It requires a change of direction. And to have that trust that God's going to move and do something is no respect of your education level. We live in the West. We don't trust well, do we? But when God enters into your situation, you might be a really faithful person. You might come to church. You might be giving it your tithe or your offering. You might be you know, living your best life, volunteering down at the shelter. You might be doing, I don't know what. You might be doing what God last told you to do. But in Will you change direction when God tells you to do something different? This is the challenge for us. When God calls you out of that comfort zone of, well, this is the way that you've always done things, let's change things up. God speaks a word into your heart. It might come from someone on a stage. It might have come from Ian or Ruth this morning. It might come from me. I don't know. It might come from you know, a conversation you have over lunch but you receive that as a word of God into your life, are you going to act on that? Are you going to receive that? Are you going to start behaving out of this new revelation, this new word? Are you just going to go, no, how can I be sure of this? Or are you going to say, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be fulfilled in me. There are so many instances, aren't there, where we could have this happen in our lives. Right, there are so many promises of God where he says and he speaks specifically into our situation even through the writings of the scripture where we might be reading it and we read oh give and it will be given to you now he's talking about judgement and mercy in this situation give mercy yeah don't be judging and God will just grant you more mercy if you're a merciful person you'll receive mercy but sometimes we want to judge that person just cut me up. Yeah? That person, I don't like the way they dress. I don't like the way they look at me. I don't like what they said to me. I don't like the way they are with me. I will judge this person. But give and it will be given to you. And you might read that and you're like, oh, well, how can I be sure of this? I, I don't know. I'll just carry on doing the last thing that God told me to do. Or maybe it's to be faithful with a little. It's talking about your resources. Are you faithful with a little? When God gives into your lap, are you faithful to give generously out of that? Talking about your resources. 
Are you a giver? Are you a generous person? Because God's promise is, if you're faithful with a little, he'll give you much. It's about your stewardship, isn't it? Are you going to trust the promise of God in that situation? Are you going to allow him to speak to you? Or honour your parents. One of the Ten Commandments even. says, honour your parents and you will live a long life. How often do we honour our parents? Are we like, yeah, 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 mum, yeah, what, what, I've heard that before. I've heard that lots of times. Oh, yeah, 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 dad, like, I, I, know, I know you're telling me to, like, you know, lay the tiles this way, but I'm not going to do that. Little kind of in-joke there between us. <laughs> so. But this is it. Are you going to honour in those situations when God calls you to do that? And come to me, all who are weary. I will give you rest. Or are you just going to keep on grinding it out? I'm just going to keep on grinding out this work. I need the money. I need the money. I'm going to keep on grinding it out. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Come to me if you're weary. I'll provide rest for you. Trust in me. Take your Sabbath. I'll provide for you because I'm a father who loves you. But it just requires that change in direction, doesn't it? That from going the, the same old way or doing the same old things, I'm doing, living, my, living my life and God enters in. And he might speak to you through an angel. I don't know. I mean, how many of us have been terrified this week for, for no reason when we bumped into someone and maybe we're like, <gasps> who is this person? They spoke truth into your life. Maybe it was God's holy messenger come to you. For that is what an angel is. Amen. Amen. So, what kind of life do you want? Do you want the kind of life where you can trust God in all things? Or do you just want to live it out and, and you kind of do the same old stuff? Do the same old stuff. You know it's good, it doesn't make you a bad person. You can be a faithful person just living the last thing that God spoke to you and just ignoring every new thing that God speaks to you. Maybe, maybe you'll be like Zechariah and you'll be struck dumb. Maybe you won't be physically unable to talk but maybe your words won't carry the weight that they once used to. Maybe the anointing will leave and the words that you say won't be as meaningful to those who hear it. Maybe. Because I want the kind of life where God turns around and says to me, yeah, well done, good and faithful servant, that I've entrusted a little to you and, and you've gone and grown that and you've done more with it and, and that requires him to speak into my life, to change the things that I know I need to change. Martin Luther says that a Christian's life is one of lifelong repentance. Yeah. That often bumps up against when God speaks to us, doesn't it? God will declare something into our lives. You need to stop doing that because that's, that's not heading in the right direction, mate. You need to turn your back on that and start heading towards me. And when you start heading towards him, that's an act of faith. It's an act of courage. It's an act of trust yeah. in your heavenly Father who wants you to move closer towards him because he loves you. So, this is it. We're drawing to a close now. The Holy Spirit's going to fall on this place. You're going to receive something from God. Maybe you've already heard it. Maybe he's going to drop something into your heart. Maybe he's going to require an act of faith on your behalf to change something, to change direction. You've been living your best life. You've been doing things well. You're a good person. I'm not saying that you're not. I'm just saying that maybe God's going to speak something and say, let's go this way. Let's interrupt your life just for a moment because I've got something better for you. I've got, I've got the Son of the Most High to come into your life. You're going to be giving birth to something incredible and amazing and it's going to be difficult you're going to come across some opposition as Mary did. 
But she had the courage and the trust in God to continue and see it through. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, I I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, that Mary's example is such a good example for us to follow. That, Lord, when we're living our best life, when we're doing all that we know to do, and we're just comfortable in that, I I pray, God, that you just come in and interrupt us. That you speak a word into our lives that's going to require us to act in faith and change direction. Lord, I'm thankful for church. I'm thankful for these people. I'm I'm thankful, God, for the vision that you've given to us. But most of all, I'm thankful for Jesus, that this act of faith by this young woman gave us the Saviour of the world, the King over my life, the King over our lives, the one under whose kingdom, rule and reign we submit ourselves. Father, help us to be humble. Help us to submit. Help us to hear your voice clearly, however you choose to speak to us. And help us go away from this place, God, empowered, living for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.